about Assyria, and I've talked about Assyria. You'll remember about um, Ephraim, um, who is uh, Syria. There's Syria and Assyria. We got two of them here, but don't confuse the two. You got Syria immediately north of Israel. Assyria is north uh, east in the Fertile Crescent up between the Tigris Euphrates River. And I tried to find a good map, and it's just hard to find a good map um, on these particular matters, but I'll show you the graphic in a minute. And then chapter nine, we're gonna talk about the Prince of Peace, which again, you're gonna recognize as a prophecy about Jesus. And then chapter 10 talks about Assyria, a series used against Israel, assures us that a remnant will be rescued. God's going to use them as his instrument to chastise a wicked and wayward people Northern Israel, chapter 11, the righteous branch, very important Bible uh, passage and one that we don't want to miss out on. Chapter 12, a, a hymn of thanksgiving for salvation. And so we're in a block of material about prophecy that we don't want to miss. And so this gives us a little bit of a forward thinking about what we're going to look at. But tonight we're looking at chapter 7. Uh, before, last, last Wednesday night, we're in chapter 6 where it was Isaiah's call, this inaugural vision, however you wish to, to put that, and we looked at it very carefully, and there's certainly a lot to the 6th chapter of Isaiah, but we want to look at chapter 7 tonight, and we come to what's called the syro ephraimatic War. Now somebody said, what in the world is that, the syro ephraimatic War? And uh, uh, don't be so impressed with those big words because all it means is Syria joined up with Ephraim to wage war against Judah. Now, if you went to 2 Kings chapter 16, you'd read all about the history of that. 2 Kings chapter 16, but we won't have the time to do that tonight. But before we can really understand what's going on with Ahaz, king of Judah, we have to know something about this syro ephraimatic war. Now, this graphic that I took off of the uh, internet, I thought this is a pretty good display here. Israel, uh, if you can read the writing, Northern Kingdom is often called Ephraim in reference to the, its largest tribe. So by this time in 2 Kings, this period of history in 2 Kings, a lot of times the word Ephraim will be used to refer to Northern Israel. You understand about the division of the kingdom. 743, I think that says Tiglath Pileser III. Now, you may not have known about Tiglath Pileser, but he's certainly one of the great kings of Assyria. When Tiglath Pileser came to the throne, he decided to spread the kingdom and make it more powerful, and he did. And by uh, Tiglath Pileser III's time, he's really exercising and asserting himself as a great Assyrian king. Assyrian Empire was a wicked empire, but he's certainly asserting himself by this time in um, the 700s. He begins conquering lands west of Assyria, including Israel, Judah, and Syria. Now, Syria is just north of Israel, keep in mind. Ahaz becomes king around 740. He has pressure from Pekah, who's king of Israel and Rezin, king of Syria to join alliance against Assyria and Ahaz refuses. That's why I put this graphic up. This will help me go through some of this history a little quicker. And so the northern king of Israel allies, allies himself with the uh, Syrian king, uh, uh, the son of Ramaliah, um, the uh, Arisen, and uh, they said, join us against Assyria. But Ahaz doesn't want to do it. And so when Ahaz decides, no, I'm not going to join you guys against Assyria, it's pretty clear who's the tough kid on the block here. It's Assyria, and I'm not going up against him. So they decide, all right, what we'll do is wage war against you. And we're going to dethrone you, and we'll put our guy in your place, and he will... Uh, do what we tell him to do, and he'll join us, and that way we'll confederate together, the three of us, and fight against Assyria. After all, the three of us joining together, our chances are a lot better than just fighting against Assyria by ourselves. However, that would do the end of the Davidic dynasty. God had promised David that his descendants would be on that throne in Judah. And, of course, to overthrow Ahaz, 
who was a wicked king anyway, but he's a descendant of David to overthrow Ahaz would go against the will of God. God's not going to let that happen. Syria and Judah attempt to depose Ahaz. That's what they want to do. They want to kick him off the throne. They want their guy on the throne. Ahaz turns to Assyria for help, and that's his big mistake. He goes to the bad guy to help him, and they're very happy to do it. And so Tiglath-Pileser comes in by uh, Ahaz and his invitation and wages war against Syria and Israel and wins. A year later, he fights the Philistines who are attacking Judah's lower southern border and defeats them. So it's very clear that Assyria is a tough character here and is a world empire for their period in the ancient Near East becomes a very powerful empire. So these are bad days for Ahaz, king of Judah. These are bad times. So we had Isaiah's inaugural vision in chapter 6. We got some real problems in Judah in chapter 7. The Philistines are attacking us from the south. Uh, Israel and Syria are attacking us from the north. Everybody is afraid of Assyria over here in the east. What is a guy supposed to do? Well, it so happens that the king has a man by the name of Isaiah, who is the prophet of God. And the prophet of God is telling the king what to do. The only problem is the king doesn't want to do what God tells him to do. And so naturally, what happens? When you don't want to do what God tells you to do, you lose. You're going to lose every time. I don't care what it is. I don't care when it is. When you go up against God, you're going to lose. And that's exactly what happens to Ahaz. Instead of partnering with God like he should, he partners with Tiglath-Pileser III, a mean, ruthless, cruel king. And he does eliminate the pressure that comes from the south and from the north, but it comes at heavy tribute and taxes and really is the beginning of the downfall of southern Judah. And it's not only... Assyria, but who's anxious to take over? There's always somebody that wants to be head, king of the world. And the next one is Nebuchadnezzar Babylon. <laughs> and he does it. He actually takes them away into captivity for some 70 years. And you know what happens after that? Persia took over after that. And you know what happened after that? The Greeks took over after that. And you know what happened after that? The Romans took over after that. And so it's just one after another that's trying to be king of the world. And that's the history of where we are. So this is where we're at. And you know, as I think about this, if this man, Ahaz, had been faithful and obedient to God, he might have changed that whole thing. If he had been faithful and obedient to God and did what Isaiah instructed him to do, he might could have changed that whole deal there. But because of his failure, now the descendants of David are but vassal kings, never to really be a king like David was or Solomon was, but mere vassal kings under the reign of greater empires and greater world kingdoms and finally, the ultimate king, Jesus Christ the righteous, is born during the time of um, Rome. And God, Emmanuel, comes in the flesh. That's where we are. That's the history of it. The syro ephraimatic they call it Ephraimite. The Syro refers to Syria. Ephraimatic refers to Ephraim. War against southern Judah to force Ahaz off the throne and put their guy on so that they will join them in their war against Tiglath-Pileser, the great Assyrian king. The first part of chapter 7, our study tonight, is the plot. So let's study the plot against Ahaz, which I've just described. In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, risen the king of Syria, and Pekah, the, king of Ram the son of Ramaliah, the king of Israel came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not yet mount an attack against it. Now, they've been pretty successful. If you went back to 2 Kings chapter 16, read that chapter there, which we'll not do tonight, it'll fill in a lot more of the details that we're talking about. 
when the house of David was told, Syria is in league with Ephraim. You'll remember who Ephraim is now? Northern Israel. The heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. What do you reckon that means? He was scared to death. He was scared to death when he realized Syria joined up with Israel. And now they're encamped just a couple of days away. It scared him to death. Now it makes clear that it's the house of David. Now a passage I think I will turn to is 2 Samuel chapter 7. So let's go back over to that there and review that just right quickly as part of our history because this is uh, an important point that we want to remember. I like this passage. It's almost humorous uh, for me, but I won't um, uh, make much of that the way he acts here. Uh, <laughs> it, it said, you know, here I am, I live, in a, I live in a house of cedar and there's not even a place for God to dwell. And then God comes to him and says, well, who told you to build me a house? I didn't tell you to build, you, build me a house. Who told you to do that for me? I didn't tell you to. I took you from the sheep coat, made you king of Israel. All you were was a shepherd boy and I made you king. Who told you to tell me what to do or to build me a house? But I'll tell you what I'll do for you. I'll build you a house. Now it's that house that I want to read about. Verse 12. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And so you see what God's getting at there. He is giving us a little glimpse of the Christ that's going to come. God's going to build him a house. It's not going to be a physical house, but it's going to be a spiritual house. And his descendant is going to reign over that house forever. Now that becomes a powerful point when we get to Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3 because the Christ is going straight back to David. And in Luke chapter 3, the Christ is going straight back to God himself. And so you see how important this point is about his reference in our verse 2 tonight when the house of David was told. Isaiah 7 and 2. They're all in league with each other and they're wage, ready to wage war against you. And this poor, wicked, weak king was scared to death because of it. And the Lord said to Isaiah, go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Joshub, your son. Now, I like the way he named his children. Shear Joshub. You have any children, grandchildren? You may want to consider Shear Joshub as a name. Um, you got another name over here in chapter 8. Let's jump over there to chapter 8. This is one of my favorite guys. And I'll pick out somebody to pronounce this name in chapter 8, verse 1. Then the Lord said to me, take a large tablet and write on, on it in common characters belonging to... Not bad, Maher Shala Hashbaz, longest name in the English Bible... Isaiah 8 and 1, my hair shall hashbaz, but I'll talk about my hair shall hashbaz later. Uh, now you may want to, you know, can you imagine calling that boy for supper? I just cannot, <laughs> I cannot imagine calling that boy for supper. Uh, Sheer Joshub is a little easier to say, but that's, that's not a common name. Now I'm making a little light of this because the names have meaning. Isaiah was told to name these boys for a reason. And the name Sheer Joshua in our lesson on I have chapter 7 means that a remnant shall return. So he takes his young boy. And here's Ahaz out there at the conduit. Now he's out there at the conduit. We're going to learn about this place later, so I'll talk about that another time. But he's probably checking on the water supply because he knows we got an enemy coming to surround the city and we got to make sure we got plenty of water. And he says, now go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Joshua, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. And his king's out there probably surveying, the idea, we got plenty of water here. 
Because what's going to happen is the Army's going to surround us and going to starve us out. And if we've got plenty of water, we'll be, able to, we'll be able to defend ourselves and be able to forego the stranglehold they're going to try to put on food and water. We're going to have, so he's out there. The king's out there. But God says, now, Isaiah, you go out there. Go out there with your boy. Just a young boy. Sure, Joshua. And when Ahaz looks at that boy, he should have learned a lesson about the remnant shall return. And he should have looked at that young man and uh, realized that God is working in these plans and say to him, this is what you're going to say to him, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint. So I saw four things there. Two of them positive, two of them, two of them negative. Be careful, be quiet. These are words of comfort, really. He wants to comfort the king. He says, now go tell the king, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint. Because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria, Syria and the son of Ramaliah. Because. Don't worry about these guys. Don't worry about Syria and Ephraim waging war against you. So God sends his prophet out there and his son as sort of an illustration or an object lesson. And he says, now don't worry about these guys. This is what God is saying. Because, verse 5, Syria and Ephraim and the son of Ramaliah has devised evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and terrify it, and let us conquer it for ourselves, and set up the son of Tabael as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, and it shall not come to pass. Don't worry about it. It's not going to happen. They're going to wage war against you, and you don't have to fear a thing. It's not going to happen. I'm not going to let it happen. For the head of Damascus, Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is risen. And within 65 years, Ephraim will be sh shattered from being a people. Within 65 years, they're going to be gone. You don't have to worry about the impending danger that you see. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Ramaliah. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. I have that part of the verse, verse 9, marked. I'd suggest you mark that. If you're not firm in faith, you're not going to stand. Now, you don't have anything to worry about. God's in control of this. God's going to take care of it. Now, from a human standpoint, this looks bad. Because we got the Philistines coming up from the south. And they're bad. And we've got Syria and uh, Israel coming down from the north. And they're bad. And we got bad people over there in the east. This looks bad. From a human standpoint, we got to really be pulling our hair out wondering what can we do? How can we negotiate? What can we? But God comes along and says, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. How can you do that? How can you not worry about it? What is it that he's telling him to do? Be a man of faith. Trust God. That's right, Scott. Be a man of faith. And trust in God. Who has Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6? You probably know that verse anyway. Go ahead. Hebrews 11 and 6. What does that verse say? That's exactly right, John. That's Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. I don't care what dispensation you live in. You got to have faith. You got to trust God. You got to take him at his word. You've got to do what he says. You got to rely on him. Let's see if we can have another verse on that. Hebrews chapter 3. Let's see if we can find uh, a passage here that will help us on the matter. This great book of faith, Hebrews 3, 13. Here you go, here you go. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. 
For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Be faithful. Now the situation looks bad. Rely on God and be faithful. The situation really is a bad deal here that we've got. Go on down there to verse 18. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? But to those who are disobedient, so we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. That's a result of unfaithfulness. They didn't get to go in, did they? They didn't go into the land of promise. Well, in chapter 4, let's see. Hebrews 4 and 2, for good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. That Hebrew generation lost out because they were not faithful. Now the plot against Ahaz could have been foiled if Ahaz had been a man of faith, but I'm trying to make an application to my life tonight. My life, I gotta be a man of faith, and sometimes things look bad. And I don't know exactly how I am to go. Well, the Bible will guide me and the Bible will lead me if I will but follow God's word in faith. So he says, now I'm back to our verse, Isaiah 7 and verse 9. If you are not firm in faith, you ain't got the strong faith that you ought to have, you will not be firm at all. You will not stand. Yes, ma'am. I'm fixing to show my ignorance, but I guess it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Well, that's going to be Sennacherib. Sennacherib, now that comes up a little later, okay? This is, this is before that. That's going to come after that in the days of Hezekiah. So this is going, that's going to come after that. So we're going to hold off on that one and come back to that later, but that's a good example. There when Hezekiah looked out there and he saw that army out there, man, oh man. And then, uh, now there's another guy there called Rabshakeh. I love these names. I just, I just think these names are great. And I remember having some goldfish when I was younger, and I named uh, one of them Tiglath Pileser, and I named another one <laughs> Rab Shacker, Shaka, and, and then you have the algae eater, I named him Dirty Doeg, and I just had all Bible names for my fish, you know, and that kind of thing, and I just always loved these Bible names. Sheer Joshua, and Isaiah, and Rab Shaka, what a guy. But anyway, I'll tell you all about him later. Now I'm in verse 10 which is the second point that I saw here tonight, the sign of the Lord, and it's probably the most important part of the whole chapter. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Now, who spoke to Ahaz? The Lord spoke to Ahaz. Now, what's Ahaz doing? Is Ahaz given, Lord, uh, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask a sign of the Lord your God. What I'm trying to say, and I'm kind of stumbling around, who's doing the talking here? Well, the Lord is, and who's mouthing it? Isaiah. Isaiah didn't say, now look, I'm going to tell you what to do. Isaiah didn't say that. Isaiah is talking to the king. Isaiah goes to the conduit. He's got his little boy there. Isaiah goes up to the king. <laughs> and he said, look, the Lord is saying to you, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. For him to speak to Ahaz, speaking through that prophet was the same thing as God speaking directly to Ahaz. He spoke to Ahaz through that prophet. It was God's word. Now, the prophet Isaiah is not saying, this is my word, or I think you ought to do this. The prophet Isaiah says, God's talking to you. Why don't you listen? Now, I guess, I don't know, when I think about these things, why can't people get that point? The Bible's talking to you. It's God talking to you. Why can't we get that point? It's God's word talking to you. It's God talking to you through his word. That's what he's doing. We've got no New Testament prophet here today. We've got no inspired speaker here today. We've got the inspired word of God, which is more important than that. This is it right here, and God's word is speaking to you. Why don't you listen to it? Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. And I will not put the Lord to the test. First of all, it was a command for him to ask. 
God commanded him, ask a sign. That's in the imperative mood. And uh, he said, now ask a sign. But Ahaz said, well, I won't put the Lord to the test. Sounds like he's a very polite guy, doesn't it? Very respectful, polite guy. No. He's already made up his mind. I do not want to listen to what God says. That's Ahaz. Now, it sounds like, oh, I don't want to bother God about this. That's not his point. His point is, I've already made up my mind. Don't bother me with Bible. I've already made up my mind. Don't be bothering me with what God says. I've already got my mind made up on this. He says, now ask for a sign. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I don't want to know what the Lord says. Is there any modern day parallel to that? I think so. And I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to worry men that you worry my God also? I'm going to give you a sign whether you ask for it or not. And here it is. Uh, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Mark Isaiah 7, 14. Mark it. You don't want to forget that verse. You want to highlight it or asterisk it or something so that you can remember that. Here's the sign. Now, there's been so much discussion on Isaiah 7:14. But I won't tell you how to answer Isaiah 7, 14. It just solves the problem, simple enough for everybody to understand. Matthew 1. You just go to Matthew chapter 1. And then you turn over here. Let's do that. We'll go to Matthew chapter 1. And um, Matthew quotes Isaiah 7, 14. And somebody says, well, who's the virgin? Who's the woman? And so we'll go to Matthew 1, and the passage is, uh, this is a story about Jesus, about verse 18, come on down to verse 22. Uh, all this took place to fulfill, I'm in Matthew 1 and 22, what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. So, it's very clear, if you read on down through here, He's talking about this young woman, Mary, who was espoused to Joseph. She is betrothed to him. Before they came together, the Holy Spirit reveals this matter to Joseph that she's with child. Verse 18 and 19. Her husband, Joseph, being a just man, unwilling to put her, put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quickly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David... You see that point about being a descendant of David? Do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She shall bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. This fulfills that. Now that settles it. Now, you can do all kinds of mental gymnastics about the word Alma and what Isaiah said and how Ahaz took it, but that settles it. Matthew 1, 22 and 23, Matthew by inspiration says, this is that, this fulfilled that, this virgin, this Mary that God picked out and the Holy Spirit has overshadowed her using the language of Luke. She's going to bear a son. This fulfills this prophecy of... Um, Isaiah to Ahaz, therefore, back in chapter 7, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, shall call his name Emmanuel. Now this really got kicked up when the Revised Standard Version back in 46 and 47 translated that young woman. This discussion really got going. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's right. Now, that's a good point. Yeah. That's right. There's nothing unusual about that, is there? That's right. And I think he's done wonderful work in helping us see the truth, see the truth in this matter, as some have tried to say, and it's amazing to me, but anyway, some have tried to say that Mary was just a young woman or this was some young woman, not necessarily a virgin. But notice also the definite article used there, the virgin. 
God had one in mind. But now I think Wallace's point is correct. If this were just a natural birth, what, there wouldn't be any sign in that. He's correct on that. This was a miraculous thing, a sign. Now, let's understand 15. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. Before that kid gets born in a few years, it won't take long. Before he would be born, I mean, as he gets born, I have to say this right, as he is born and as he begins to grow, uh, Pika and Resin will be gone. You don't have anything to worry about. I mean, it's not that he's talking about a young child back then. The virgin refers to the Matthew 1, 22 and 23 verse. But he is saying, if a young child were born and before he got of age, Rezin and Pekah would be gone. You don't have anything to worry about. This is your sign, Ahaz. But Ahaz betrays himself. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. In that day, the Lord will whisper, and I need to wait a second about that, but now he betrays himself by verse 17, and basically he says, I'm not doing it. I'm going to Assyria to be friends with Assyria and let them get me out of this jam. So he refuses the sign. So you have in Isaiah 7 a powerful passage that talks about the birth of Christ and its fulfillment is seen in Matthew 1, 22 and 23. And a lot of ink has been spilled on this particular matter and Alma is used in this verse, means a virgin, one who has not been involved in any relationship with a man, not just a young woman, uh, a young woman may be a virgin, but not necessarily. Here he's talking about the virgin, the young woman who's never had relationship, a particular young woman, and he's talking about Christ. He's talking about Christ there in Isaiah 7, 14. So you want to write in your margin, Matthew 1, 22 and 23. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I think so. Right, he wouldn't do it. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I think if he would have just accepted the word of God, he would have eliminated all of the problem that he's going to face with Assyria. He made a bad mistake lining up with Assyria. And if he'd have just followed Isaiah's advice, which was God's word, then he would have eliminated that problem altogether. And the sign was to help him see that. Now, he wouldn't take Sir Joshua as a sign, so he, but he, he wouldn't take uh, the miraculous sign that God had in mind for him to take. He said, I'm going to give you a sign whether you ask for it or not, to help you see the choice you should make. But even then, he wouldn't do it. He was a wicked king determined to do things his way. And he suffered in the process. And then the third point is, guess what happens when you don't do what God says? You know, isn't it a simple thing? The punishment of unbelievers, 18 through 25. Clint, you had a point here for me? No? Okay. Uh, in that day, the Lord will whistle for the fly that is at the end of the streams of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. Now, you ought to underline it, Egypt and Assyria because... The king's going to try to find help from people like this, and as they do, uh, they're going to act like just insects. They're going to be like bees hovering around them, more of a pest than a help. And they will all come and settle in the steep ravines, in the cliffs of the rocks, and on all the thorn bushes, and on all the pastures. In that day, you see how that style is kind of emphasized now? In that day, verse 18. In that day, verse 20. In that day, the Lord will shave with a razor that is hired beyond the river and the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the feet, and it will sweep 
uh, sweep away the beard also, be it a great day of disgrace for you, Ahaz. Great day of disgrace. In that day, verse 21, a man will keep alive a young cow and two sheep, and because of the abundance of milk that they give, he will eat curds. For everyone who is left in the land will eat curds and honey. There won't be anything left to eat. The only thing to eat will be the natural food because there won't be anyone left to till the land and the soil and produce anything. And so it's a time of hardship that day. Punishment for the unbelievers. Another in that day found in verse 23. Every place where there used to be a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silver will become briars and thorns. With bow and arrows, a man will come there, for all the land will be briars and thorns. And as for all the hills that used to be hoed with a hoe, you will not come there for fear of briars and thorns, but they will become a place where cattle are let loose and where sheep tread. So the sheep will tread it down. Devastation to the land. It'll all grow up under briars and thorns. Anybody like a hoe? Is anybody here that likes a hoe? Good. I'm glad. I'm talking among reasonable people. I don't like hoes either. <laughs> my, yeah, my dad wore me out on a hoe a long time ago. And so when I see the word hoe here, I don't care for it at all. But anyway, his point was, it used to be a lush, beautiful, very fertile area that had so much produce, but now it's just briars and thorns. It's nothing. And you know what it reminds you of? I'll tell you what it reminds you of. A choice vineyard chapter 5 here's a choice vineyard and the, and the husbandman hoed it and prepared it and brought a choice vine and planted it and what did it produce wild grapes now why did that vineyard produce wild grapes well it's kind of picking up on that parable of the vineyard that we read about in chapter 5 and he's saying this is one of the consequences of the uh, Rebellion, uh, you're going to lose everything. Used to be a beautiful place. That's so typical, isn't it? When you turn from God and you reject the Word of God, and you won't listen to the Word of God. And God's given you a sign, Ahaz, but this is what's going to happen. The, the uh, parable of the vineyard and now the punishment of the unbelievers because they refuse to obey. I think the important takeaway, and there are many from this chapter, is this matter of the sign. It was a sign for Ahaz to trust in God, Isaiah 7, 14. He should have trusted in God. That's much of what Isaiah is trying to say. Don't go to Egypt. Notice verse 18. Don't go to Assyria. Don't do it. Don't line up with Assyria. Don't line up with Egypt. They're going to be your downfall. In that day, the Lord will whistle for the fly, verse 18, that is at the end of the streams of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. Don't do it. Don't go down there. They're not going to help you. They're just going to be an annoyance and a nuisance for you. This was a sign for him to put his trust in God. And Ahaz wouldn't do it. It was a sign of a distant day that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. Now, I've sit and listened to preachers talk about this and argue about this and this, that, and the other. And say, well, it's a dual fulfillment. And then another one say, no, it's not a dual fulfillment. Uh, it had Jesus in mind all along. It wasn't a dual fulfillment. I don't get too exercised over that particular matter. I think the main point is it was a sign for that wicked king, God's going to do something for his people. And you need to put your faith and trust in that. And Matthew is the final word on it. Matthew 1, 22 and 23. Whatever Matthew said about it, right. And Matthew said Mary is the virgin that he had in mind in, Matthew, in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. And so that's the end of that story. It was a sign of a distant day when God is going to bless his people. It was a sign for us to believe that God has become man. And what does Emmanuel mean other than God with us? And so he's telling us in that uh, great passage, let's go back to uh, the Matthew 1 passage and pick up on that again. Matthew 1. And I was reading 22 and 23, and um, this is a great passage. The Lord appeared to him in a dream. 
Uh, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. I wonder what he thought. He thought that Mary had been unfaithful to him. Now, they were espoused or betrothed. It was stronger than an engagement. He's act she's actually called his wife here. It is an accommodative term. They did not have uh, privileges as husband and wife would have. But yet, it was a stronger covenant agreement between them than just an engagement. For him to put her away, it had to be a bill of divorcement for him to put Mary away, which he was going to do. Now, he's going to try to do the right thing about it. He didn't want to make a public example out of her. But as he considered these things, verse 20, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Now, the word Jesus means Savior. And you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and, call, and she shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, you ought to underline the word Emmanuel. And what does that mean? Well, he tells us. See, Joe's, uh, Matthew's writing, and he thinks, well, these Greek readers read this. They're not going to understand. Gentiles are going to come along and read this. They're not going to understand that. So I'm going to tell them what Emmanuel means, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. And so it is a miraculous conception and birth here, though the birth was a normal birth that women would experience giving birth to a child. Still, it was miraculous in the sense that God put himself in human form in the womb of a woman. Now, that's amazing to me. That is amazing to me. And he prophesied about it <laughs> way ahead of time that this is going to happen. It is a sign for us to believe that God became man, Emmanuel. And you ought to mark, underline the word Emmanuel, God with us, and that means something. God is with us. God is with us. That's a great thing to know, which means God with us. God has come down to be with us. And that's great that we have relationship with God, that can, we can be children of God because of this. I just am amazed at the wonderful scheme of redemption and the great plan which God had in bringing all this about. Comment a question before we go. Next Wednesday night, the attack on Emmanuel's land, chapter 8. And um, we will study that and so... Practice up on that word in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 1. And I'm going to give you a test on that. See if you can say that three times real fast. Meher Shalah Hash Baz. And uh, when I first came to Broadway, there you go. There you go. They really had some names for these fellas, didn't they? Uh, Judah's problems will soon be here. <laughs> My hair shall a hush pause. Now, I don't hear anything else about Sheer Joshua. That's the only time we meet Sheer Joshua in chapter 7, is in chapter 7, verse 3, and then this My hair shall a hush pause in uh, Isaiah chapter 8. They asked me to speak to the young people when I first came here. It's been a number of years back. I said, All right, I believe I will. And so I turned to Isaiah chapter 8, verse 1. I read this name, and I said, now that's, uh, can anybody in here pronounce that name? And nobody in there can pronounce the name. Our teenagers, young people. I didn't really expect anybody to pronounce that name, but I said, now this is um, how you pronounce that name. But it's not the hardest word to say in the Bible. You know what the hardest word to say in the Bible is? No. That's the hardest word to say. No. I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not going to participate in that. No, I'm not going to say that. That's the hardest word to say is the word no. Not my hair shall a hush pause. But I'm going to tell you all about that next time, Lord willing. Come in a question before we go. Anybody? Isaiah chapter 7. We'll look at chapter 8 next uh,
next uh, Wednesday night. All right. Uh, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll be dismissed.